Psalms 27, verse, verses 1 through 6. If you have it, say amen. amen. So if you weren't here last Sunday, let me tell you what happened. <laughs> I preach part one, escaping the darkness. During the service, as I preached this message, the enemy tried hard to stop this message of deliverance. As we, we, we began to experience pulsating blackouts. As if someone was at a switch. To, and almost like every time I mentioned about the enemy or spiritual warfare, the light would go off. Remember that? And we had temporary blackouts. And what was happening, the lights would go off here. And then I would lose the microphone, and when you're preaching into a microphone, and then you're preaching to a, a no microphone, that's very difficult. And I knew the enemy was trying to prevent this message. The lights would go off, they would go on. At one point, this was red and then blue, and it felt like the Star Spangled Banner song. <laughs> it, was just, it, it was just the more I preached, the more the enemy tried to sabotage, I believe it was a, de a, a demonic attack because there was subsequent at the very end, the enemy decided to leave the lights off and we had a tremendous altar service in the dark as this altar was filled to capacity. Can someone praise the Lord? And many people were delivered during that altar call. Uh, we have received numerous reports from that. Amen. And and I appreciate the prayer support and the comments from people. Uh, um, I was not going to let the enemy, I was not going to dismiss, I was not going to let the enemy distract me from this assignment. Many of you don't know this, but I learned how to preach in the streets of New York City. That's my training. You preach before defiant, angry people. So all that did was pull the New York out of me, amen. And I, I was going to preach no matter what, amen. But I felt impressed. Uh, this week to preach part two of that message, amen. So let's read uh, Psalms 27, verses 1 through 6. For the next few moments, I'm going to preach on the subject, Escaping the Darkness, part, part two. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength or stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, meaning evil people, came against me to eat up my flesh, meaning to devour me, to eat me alive, my enemies and my foes, they stumbled and fell. Enemies are those that have feelings of hatred against you. Foes are those that fight against you. Though an army may encamp against me, what is an army? An army is a group of people that are in agreement together Though people agree together to come against you, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, in this I will be confident. War is when a kingdom declares that all its resources will be used against someone or something or another nation. In other words, the war is declared against me by all of hell. Uh, in this I will be confident. And this is verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Continuing with verse number 4, which will be my main text tonight, this morning. One thing I have desired or ask of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may, number one, dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Number two, to behold the beauty of the Lord. And number three, and to inquire in his temple. Verse five, for in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. That is the place of protection in the secret place of the tabernacle. He shall hide me. The tabernacle is the place of his presence. He shall set me high upon the rock. That is the place of positioning. Verse six, and now my head shall be lifted above my enemies. My head shall be lifted above the headhunters uh, that are all around me. Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle, I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the reading and ministry of your word. Father, I pray for a fresh anointing this morning as I attempt to
preach your mind and your will to us this morning. Lord, I pray that our hearts will be receptive to your word. And Lord, I pray that if someone still needs deliverance this morning, I pray they will leave this place having been delivered from darkness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Before I preach, let me mention something else in light of current events. Israel. Psalms 122, verse 6. Pray for the peace of Israel. I need to say this. What's happening in the Middle East, it's not political, it's not racial, but it is spiritual. Why? Because Israel is God's chosen people. God's, God is the only nation on earth created and birthed by God. I thought America was. No, America was a bunch of people that got together and they felt impressed to start a country with the blessing of God. But Israel is the only one that started by God. And I want to let you know that we stand with Israel. It's not a political, it's a spiritual statement. Israel uh, is loved by God. And we we ought to pray. It's not a political statement. Just like here in the United States, the racial unrest and the riots and everything, uh, we don't have, uh, we've, I've heard preachers say this and I love it, we don't have, uh, we don't, well, we, we don't have a, a, a skin problem, we have a sin problem. Okay, this side, amen, this side, you just looked at me. We don't have a skin problem, we have a sin problem. Amen. That's, forget about all these theories, critical race and everything. The real issue is all of us are born wired as sinners. And that cannot be changed by legislation. Whether you're black, white, Hispanic like myself or international, whether you're a citizen or not. The issue is not political, it's not power, it's not race. It's not white privilege, black privilege, black life, blue life, white life, and yellow life. It, it, that's not the issue. That's all. That's not the issue. That's right. yeah. Hallelujah. In fact, since I'm on it, let me, let me tell you about this. Jesus died for the entire world, for God so loved the world. And Jesus has called us to church. Listen carefully. This is not my sermon. This is the preview of something else. But Jesus has called us to be fishers of men. Fishers of men. And I'm not, how many of you are fishers? You fish. Okay, I'm not, but I, I, I don't fish, but I know how to Google. And I learn, and, but I, I understand one thing, that in the Bible, Jesus did not fish with a fishing pole. He fished with a net. I said Jesus did not fish with a fishing pole. He fished with a net. He has called us to fish. We are called fishers of men, and we are called to use a net. What what do you mean, pastor? Jesus did not take a rod and reel and cast and say, okay, I'm fishing for black fish. I'm fishing for white fish. Oh, I'm fishing only for people in Cinco Ranch. I'm preaching for international people. I'm fishing for people who are affluent because if they join the church, they could tithe. That's how churches are being built right now, folks. The Lord has called us to be fishers of men. Red and yellow, black and white. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I share that because we're not going to let politics influence um, what the church does. Amen. That's not my sermon, but it felt good to say it. Amen. Praise the Lord. And I'm, I'm very, we are a very international church. We have people from here, not just different skin colors, people from all over the world. And I'm not going to let the enemy come and bring some garbage inside the church and cause division. Praise the Lord. 
Hallelujah. When we go to heaven, we'll be all sitting and living next to each other to get used to it downstairs. Amen. Praise the Lord. I get restless when I hear about churches that are designed for the purpose to identify, to identify certain demographics, and that's where they target. Amen. That's not Jesus at all. That's not my Jesus. My Jesus was with Samaritans. He was with Gentiles. He was with Jewish people. He, he was a, the Bible. You know what he was accused of? He was accused of being a, a friend of sinners. All kinds of background, thieves and, 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 and long sharks. Praise the Lord. All kinds of background, all kinds of color and hair textures. Praise the Lord. I want you to understand that's, that's, that's not just my heart. That's the heart of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Okay, that, that's not my sermon, but I just felt good to say that. In case, people, in case anyone's wondering. <laughs> Escaping the darkness. Many years ago, my wife and I, my son, we like day trips. And we went to St. Marcus here in Texas. And by the way, some of you, you've been living in Houston forever, and you have never driven outside, San, uh, outside uh, Houston. There was uh, several years ago, someone in our church, and I hear anymore, they've been living in Texas 25 years and never been to um, uh, um, other places uh, in, in Texas, never been to at all. I'm, I'm thinking, this life outside Houston here, this beautiful hill country, never been to hill country and anything like that. Amen. So my wife and I, David, good to see you. Welcome back. You're home for the holiday, one of our young adults. Amen. I'm going to embarrass you. Uh, um, you back in college, St. Marcus, New Braunfels. And, and I tell, last week, I, I, we had people graduating here, and I told them what I told you many times. When you leave, go to college, find a church, don't shop forever. Right. Amen. And last week, I was at district council, and the church you're going to, your pastor came to me. And he said, thank you. You have a young man from our church named David, uh, David Rodriguez, a junior. He's in our church, and we love him. He's involved in our worship team. And thank you for thank you. He's stellar, and that made me feel wonderful. Yeah. That made me feel wonderful. That now we're being a blessing. Amen. Amen. And that's exactly, I want to let you know that. And I didn't mean to embarrass you, but I meant to use you as an example. Amen. So my wife and I and Taylor, we went to St. Marcus, and they took me to this place where there's underground caves, the caverns. I said, why not? <laughs> so you go to this, some of you never heard of it. You go and you go, you climb down, and you go to these underground caverns, and it's, 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 it's cooler, it's it's, it's, it's and I go, hey, listen, I'm thinking, what's the big deal? Maybe some bats or something. I could deal with that. <laughs> hey, listen, I've done, I've done the subways in New York City. I've done Harlem. I went to school in, in Manhattan. I, I, I could handle Brooklyn. Hey, I could do this. I'm sharing this for a reason, okay? I thought I was tough. We go down to the caves, and then our tour guide does something I wasn't expecting. He said, everyone stand still. We're going to turn off the lights. No big deal. And it turned off the lights. I have never been in a place with total darkness. Total darkness. Zero. You know, that's not, a lot of times, oh, it's dark, but you could barely see something. You could see a little light or something. Zero. It was pitch Black. And after a few minutes, I began to panic <laughs> because I could not see anything. Zero. A fear that I never experienced on the subway of New York City, a fear that I never experienced having to walk down a quiet street at nighttime, a fear that gripped me because it was pitch black. I opened my eyes, I closed my eyes, there was no difference. <laughs> and as I experienced that darkness, crazy thoughts began to enter my mind. This is it. They'll never find you. <laughs> Your family has disappeared. Rebecca, are you here? Rebecca, Rebecca, are you here? 
crazy thoughts, I began to panic. I began to have fear. And when Mr. Tourist, tour guide, turned the light on, I was relieved. Amen. The psalmist David was experiencing a spiritual dark place. The issue he's addressing here was not just the enemies around him, but he had experienced a personal dark place. Crazy thoughts began to attack his mind. I know that because in verse 9, he talks about those crazy thoughts. In verse 9, he talks about... God, don't hide your face from me. In other words, he was saying, God, you're hiding from me. God, don't be angry because he thought God was angry. God, don't forsake me because he thought God was forsaking him. Crazy thoughts because he was in a dark place. It's interesting, that phrase, a dark place. He's in a dark place. It's a phrase that is used by secular people to describe something they cannot analyze or handle, or treated with therapy, a dark place. It speaks of a horrific, horrific comes from the word horror. Horrific and paralyzing sense of hopelessness. A dark place. Well, how did David, Mr. Psalmist, Mr. Anointed, how did he handle this dark place. Well, I preached about this last week. He was able to manage the dark place by making a declaration. That's why he starts Psalms 27, not you are my fortress, you are my, you are my banner, you are my shield. He starts with the Lord is my light yes. and my salvation, whom shall I fear? For David understood that the Lord was the only one that could dispel this darkness. The Lord was the only one that could dispense the, the crawling spiritual vermin that hides in dark places. He understood that the Lord was still the bright and morning star. He understood that the Lord was still the light of the world and the enemy would be unable to snuff it. He understood when he declared, the Lord is my light and my salvation, he was speaking forth truth. And truth is always greater than feelings of facts. When I, went to, when I was in that dark place in that cavern, my feelings went haywire. My thoughts went haywire, and I had to speak truth to myself. I am not dead. I haven't disappeared. I'm still alive. My wife is still here. My son is still here. I have to speak truth because truth always trumps feelings and facts. So David managed those fears, those crazy thoughts by making a declaration, the Lord is my light and my salvation. There's a man named Raymond Edmond. He was chancellor of Wheaton College. And years later, he became vice president of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. I want to give him credit because I've heard many preachers quote this quote and not give him credit. He said, quote, never doubt in the dark what God has told you in the light. Isn't that good? Never doubt in the dark what God has told you or revealed to you in the light. See, there's times when you are experiencing a blessing. The lights are on and you're feeling good about everything. God has spoken to you, rain my word through his word and given you prophetic words and verses there. And you feel that God has spoken to you. God is with you. And the enemy comes and turns the light out. And you're in a dark place. It doesn't cancel what God has said to you. It doesn't cancel the truth 
and the calling of God upon your life. So I love the statement. Never doubt in the dark because you will experience dark places. You will experience dark seasons. Well, we are, we are on earth, you and I will experience those dark, those dark moments. That's why hell, heaven is calling us. We are homesick for heaven. Even Jesus experienced a dark place when he hung on the cross and said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The only time that Jesus referred to God as God and not as Father. You and I will experience dark places. But never doubt in the dark what God has told you in the light. So David managed this dark place by making a declaration. That was last week's sermon. Number two, new sermon. David managed the dark place by making a determination. Declaration, determination. Verse four, one thing I have desired or determined of the Lord, that will I seek. In other words, David was saying, I have one top priority. I have many priorities. I have a bucket list, but I have one very top priority in life that I will embrace even when I'm in a dark place. That is my top priority, whether the lights are on or I'm in a pitch black situation. One top priority. Even when I don't feel like it, even when I don't see God working like the song says, even when all my senses are going haywire, even when I'm attacked by enemies and the army and the war, one thing I do. I'm not going to let anything deter me from that one thing. Then in verse 4, he breaks down that one thing into three parts. First, he says, that I may dwell. Underline the word dwell. Dwell. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. In other words, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord for the rest of my life on earth. He was saying... I'm determined not to abandon my commitment to God. I'm determined not to change my address or live out of a suitcase, but I'm determined to dwell, dwell, reside in the secret place. See, a lot of times what happens when we experience a, 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 a spiritual blackout, then we start thinking, maybe it's time for me to move. Maybe it's time for me to do something else. We panic. And the Lord said, no, 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 that's not the time for you to make crazy decisions. You stay put. Never make make a decision during a crisis. Never. Never, because you think it makes sense, and it may not make sense. I'm determined, he's saying, to reside in the presence of the Lord, even in a dark place. I am determined to practice his presence despite the dark place. What does that mean, practice his presence? Oh, I did that in the cavern. Rebecca, are you there? Hi, I love you. Why did I do that? I wanted to be assured that she didn't float away. I love you too. Rebecca, I can't see you, but can you? Can I hold your hand? I was practicing the presence. Hey, son, are you there too? Did you, did I lose you? But he was small. Well, I was, I was practicing the presence. Even though I was not able to see my wife, I practiced the presence. When you are in a dark place, you ought to practice the presence. You talk to him, he'll talk back. You say, you say can, I, can I feel your touch? He will touch you. And once you feel the touch, you find, I can handle this darkness. <laughs> I'm still, he hasn't left me. Hallelujah. 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 If there's ever, listen, if there's ever a critical time when you're facing a dark place, if you're watching online, listen to me carefully. If you're experiencing a dark time, if there's ever a critical time, 
to be in God's house mm-hmm. is during the dark times. It's interesting because as a pastor, one of the things I, my wife and I hear often is people saying, I, I'm going through a difficult time, a hard time. That's why I haven't been to church. Some of you don't want to amen because you think it's, you don't want me to think it's you. Oh, Pastor, it's been so hard. Just pray for me. We haven't been to church because of this. I lost my job, the situation, health. I haven't been to church because I'm in a dark place. As if that makes sense to the kingdom of God. When in the Bible, people went to church, especially when they were persecuted. Because they needed each other. To dwell in the house of God. David was saying, I don't want to play hooky. Not during the dark time. You know, I shared this story. I went through probably one of the most darkest times of my life when I was 30 years old, eight years ago. (laughs) And I had, um, (laughs) and I had, um, I had spent 13 years in full-time ministry in the church plant in New York City. And I quit because I burned out. Actually, I, I tried to be transparent with you. I quit the ministry. My mother had a psychotic breakdown, ended up in the, in the, in the psych- psychiatric ward and experienced years of mental illness. She had adopted a young girl who was my adopted sister who ran away from home, became a crack addict. And this happened the ho- that year. My mother, my brother and I, who, my brother who's a psychiatric social worker and an ordained minister, we had to take her many times and admit our own mother to the psych unit. This young girl disappeared, and then the police would call us two months later and say she's on top of a tenement building there in the South Bronx about to jump on high on crack cocaine, and 150 people downstairs saying, jump, jump, jump. I had no job, no money, and the church that I had poured my heart, uh, my heart with, out with, had abandoned me because I quit and they thought, and the pastor and everybody started saying things about me that was not true. And I felt very forsaken. Interesting, David says in verse 9, you know, uh, don't forsake me. And if you read it, verse 10, he says, when my mother and my father forsake me. Do you see that there? When my mother and my, you, many of you quote this. When my mother and my father forsake me, the Lord would take care of me. Remember that? You, you see that? The thing is, David's mother and, and father never forsook him. So why is he saying that? It, there's no record that his mother and his father forsook him. He is saying, when people in my life, they will like family. When people that were like, like a father who would protect me and provide for me. When people that were in my life like a mother who nurtured me and cared for me. Who were like family. And then they turn on me and leave me. That, you could go to a dark place. And that's when he said, though my mother and my father, people that were friends and now have become enemies, forsake me. The Lord would take care of me. Yeah. That's something he had, to, he had to hold on in the light. He had to hold on in the dark when he experienced a dark place. I, I'm, I'm preaching from my heart. That's how I, I, I feel like you were like family. You were like my father and my mother, and you have abandoned me. And my mother is, has gone over the edge. I'm taking her to a psychiatrist. Uh, this young girl is, jump, is want to jump out of a building. I have no money. No one would touch me. And then people avoided me because people thought that I was in sin. And then no one would have me preach. And I went, and I went through a, a personal, spiritual, dark place. When suddenly I, I was all alone. I remember going that summer to a concert, a Carmen concert in Long Island. And there was about 40 people from the church that I had helped planted. And they, avoid, they sat over there, sat here, hi, how are you? But you know when they don't want you to get close. That cut me to the heart. I said, I, can I just sit with you? And they just avoided me. I'm thinking, Lord, maybe I said, maybe I have hidden sin. And, the, and, and, and I had to realize there was no sin. It was just, sometimes people get funky. 
During that time of a dark place, I was tempted to stay home and pout and not go to church, to heal. But you know what I did? It's one of the smartest things I did at age 30 because I was 30. I was not so smart. You know, you get smarter when you get older, right? (laughs) Young people, I love you. I'm trying to shoot straight, though. You know what's one of the smartest things I did? I went to church every opportunity the church was open. I, I remember I would, I would travel from Westchester County. For those of you that know New York City, I would travel from Westchester County to Long Island City, Queens, New York, over, two, oh, oh, over one, one bridge, tolls, to go to church at Evangel Church there in Long Island City, go to church, and then drive back over the bridge back to Westchester County, and only to turn around. They had Sunday night service. I would drive back. Why? Because I needed to be in church. And I would drive back over the bridge, pay toll, go to, go to church, and drive over the bridge, go back. They had a Wednesday night service, and I was there all the time. I started working a job in the Board of Education as a counselor, a drug counselor. And I, on Wednesday night, I would get home tired from work and realize I'm tired. I don't feel like going to church, but I'm going to church because I need church. I would eat something quickly, get in my car, drive from Westchester County uh, over the Drosneck Bridge, go into the, in Queens and go to Queens, New York, and then come back another route, Triborough Bridge, back to Westchester County on Wednesday night because I needed to be in church. And to add to that on Tuesdays, because that church did not have Tuesday service, I would drive all the way from Westchester County to Brooklyn to go to Brooklyn Tabernacle to the prayer meeting, and I would sit there, and I, would just, I just needed to be in God's house. Yeah. I needed to be in God's house around God's people to remind me I'm not alone. To hear the word of God, but just to be around God's people. And a lot of them I didn't know, but just to be in people that were like-minded. I'm here to encourage you as a pastor. Don't pull away from church during times that you're feeling horrible or in a dark place. Can someone say amen? Amen. I'm not being the evangelist this morning. I'm being the pastor. To behold, verse 4, the second part of the determination. To behold or gaze the beauty of the Lord. David was saying, I'm determined to remember in the dark how beautiful the Lord is. I'm determined to focus on who he is and not on the enemy, the army, or the war around me. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18, listen to this. It says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know or see the hope to which he has called you. During that time, David was saying, I'm determined to see the Lord, not just dwell in his presence, to see. And sometimes to see the Lord, you have to close your eyes and remember how beautiful he is. Remember him in the beauty of his holiness. When my wife and I got married, before we got married, and I was in love. I was traveling. I was still traveling. I was working for Nikki Cruz. And, uh, and th- from the point that we I proposed to our wedding was nine months. Most of those nine months I was traveling somewhere. And she had to put the, most of the wedding together by herself. And remember, this is the days we didn't have phones, folks. Young people, there was no phones in those the iPhones in those days. <laughs> there was no FaceTime. Think about it. Some of you, how, how are you? Good to see you. What are you doing? I'm just walking around. And I couldn't even do that. I had a picture in my wallet, but sometimes I would be in bed and it would be dark. And you know what I would do? I would close my eyes and remember how beautiful she was. Amen. Don't say all. Oh, oh. You ought to do the same thing. <laughs> if you're married, you better know. Amen. 
I'm an artist. I went to art school for four years in New York. And I remember sometimes I would say, I hope I don't even forget how she looks like. Because I would be away like two weeks in a row. And I would sit, I was, I would, I would, I would go in the restaurant, I would draw how she looked like. <laughs> Make sure I didn't forget. When you're in a dark place, to behold the beauty of the Lord, you ought to shut your eyes and remember how beautiful he is. And when you remember how beautiful he is, that dark, that dark grip begins to let go. Whatever you behold, you become. I've said that many times. It's the principle in the Bible. Whatever you behold, you become. And it's easy when you're in a dark place, you start focusing on the dark things around you and not beholding how beautiful he is. We sing that song often, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in this wonderful face and the things of this world, right? Whatever you behold, you become. I've said this many times, I'll share it again. That's a, a, a biblical principle. I was raised in the inner city for the passion of South Bronx. Gangs, pimps, drug addicts, criminals, the worst of the worst. I was raised without a dad. My dad died when I was a month old. And all those kids grew up watching. Oh, look at that. If you sell drugs, you could drive a nice car like that. He drives a nice car. He, has, he flashes money. Look at that. That person is, that person is a, he's a thug. He's a, he's a homeboy. He's tough. And he's respected. And you have kids watching. I remember kids looking out the window, sitting in the stoop. And eventually, as they got older, they began to become the very thing they were looking at. Whatever you behold, you become. When I moved to East Texas in Tyler, Texas, as a crusade director, I was living in Tyler, outside Tyler, near Buller, Texas, when Buller was a little nothing town. And I remember seeing a couple of kids in Buller, Texas. They were dressed like gang, gang bangers from the South Bronx. Never been to the ghetto. You guys from Tyler, remember? Buller, when it was like, and they were like, yo, what's up? And I'm thinking, you have never even seen concrete. You have never even seen brick. Yo, and I'm thinking, but the same demons that harassed and manipulated the kids I grew up with were upon these kids, whatever, because they were busy watching at that time MTV and, and emulating what they saw. Whatever you behold, you become. I'm sharing you because I made a decision as a young man when I got saved at 12 years old to behold Jesus. To behold Jesus. And then when God began to bring godly men and women to God in my life, I began to emulate them and behold them. Whatever you behold, you become. During dark times, we are tempted to behold someone other than Jesus. Because we want a savior. And I'm telling you, learn who Jesus is, and then doing dark places, like I've done many times, close your eyes and see how beautiful he is. Whatever you behold will hold you. Whatever you behold will own you. Whatever you behold, you will become. And the enemy turns the lights off to get you to behold something other than him, than the Lord Jesus Christ. Young people, listen to me carefully. I, I get it. You want to be stylish. You want to do all these things. I get it. But be careful. Parents, oh, my goodness. Parents, you, you're not going to amen me, and you're going you, to you're get angry at me, but that's okay. Because afterwards, we're taking the woman of God to eat, and we're going to enjoy eating Italian food, and I'm going to forget how angry you were. <laughs> once, once I have my sausage and peppers, I'm, I'm, I'm moving on. <laughs> Parents. Monitor who and what your kids behold. Let's go eat. Everyone eat. We're together. And all the kids are. There's people here, folks. There's people. There's people. Look at me. Oh, they're just playing games. 
I know you're not saying amen. Right. I'm meddling. That's okay. What are they watching, games? What, what are they streaming in their room? My son is here. He could testify. He never had a TV. Stu doesn't have a TV in his room. We have one TV at the house. You don't have one in every room? No, not even in the closet. We have just one. Because when it was out of the open, and whenever he saw something, he said, everyone could see it. And as a young man, he had a, a computer. It was public. And for a million years, he had the app, Covenant Eyes. Remember that? You were like the three people in your Christian school that had Covenant Eyes. He couldn't do anything. Why did we do that? Because we were parents. We didn't want a young, impressionable boy to behold something that the enemy would sneak in. And I learned about the phone. I learned, about, I, I learned that you could bypass things through a YouTube link. I learned, we, why did we do that? Because we were protecting our son. Amen. Parents, snap out of it. Parents, get involved. You are the parent. That's, that's, a, that's a divine call from God. You have a parent anointing. Well, I, I, want, I, I don't want to invade his privacy. Teach him about privacy, but you're the parent. Let them learn how to manage it. But you are the parent. You don't give your four-year-old the keys to the car. Then why are you giving them the keys to the internet? Can someone say amen? amen. Our church is called Family Life Assembly of God. I want to live up to that. Hallelujah. The parents, monitor who and what your kids behold. Be careful. They're impressionable. They are impre- they, even, when, even when you don't think they're looking at three years old, they're looking around, and they'll copy somebody. They'll copy the sports figure. How do you throw the hoop? How do you bat? Of course they copy. But they're going to copy, copy the attitudes. They're going to copy, they're gonna copy the, those things. They're like sponges. Okay, I, I know that this, is, this was not my notes, but I felt impressed to say that. Amen. And you don't believe that's how we raise us. Interview my son. Amen. Contribute to his college fund, and then you can ask him whatever. We need a third table back there in the lobby. I'm closing. Musicians, would you come? Verse 4, one thing I have determined of the Lord, that would I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the rest of my life, dwells, number one, to behold the beauty of the Lord, number two, and finally, and to inquire in his temple. The word inquire is also translated to seek. He was saying, I am determined to seek or worship the Lord even in the dark. I am determined to worship the Lord even in the dark. In Psalm 16, verse 10 through 11, David says, For you will not leave, for you will not leave my soul in Sheol. Or in other words, you will not leave my soul in a dark place. Nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. And in your right hand, pleasures evermore. During the dark times, he will worship the Lord and get closer to the Lord. As he got closer to the Lord, he enjoyed the fullness of his presence. There is fullness of joy. He got closer to God. When David says in the Bible, come magnify the Lord with me, let us rejoice together. It doesn't necessarily mean let's, let's pump God bigger. Let's like, like a, one of those plastic things that you like Santa Claus, you pump with air and then in the front yard. It doesn't mean that. Let's make God bigger. 
It means when you draw close to God, he appears bigger. So right now, David, stand. I'm, I'm picking you today. Okay, from here, you look like this. You look small. But as I get close to you, I see you big and you gain some weight and you look good, man. And I get close and I realize, oh my goodness, he's grown up. When you first came to this church, you were like a little mijito. You've grown up. Thank you. When you magnify the Lord, that means you use praise to draw close to the Lord. And you're saying, you know what? I'm going to downsize you, devil, by getting closer to the Lord. And the way you get closer to the Lord is with praise and adoration. And suddenly you realize how big he is. God is always big, but you don't realize how big he is until you get close. And the way you get close is to praise and worship. And when you get close, you realize how puny the enemy is. But when you allow the enemy to get close to your, to your grill, when he, you let the enemy get close to your life, he appears bigger than what he is. So we need to magnify the Lord in a dark place and be reminded how big God is. Someone praise the Lord, would you stand? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Dark place. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? He is still the light. He is still the light. Jesus is the light. Jesus is the light. Listen, folks, it's about Jesus. Pastor, what's the point you're trying to make? I'm afraid that lately, in the past 20 years or so, our churches, in order to attract more people, they don't sing and preach about Jesus. They talk about God. God is love. God is this. Their statement says, you know, you are special to God. Everything's about God. But they don't talk about Jesus. We are Christians, Christ. But they don't talk about Jesus. The songs are generic. Why? Because people are not offended if you talk about God. Everyone loves God, quote, from different religions. But when you start preaching Jesus, then people take sides. The New Testament church preach Jesus crucified. It was the message of that Jesus that got them persecuted. He said, if I be lifted up, he is the light. It's all about Jesus. Yes, it's about God. But God in the flesh, Jesus. Don't be embarrassed to talk about Jesus. Don't Try to be politically correct by talking to people about God. No, it's Jesus. He is the Savior. God sent Jesus so that you and I can see how he looks like. For Jesus is the selfie of God. So that you can behold him. Learn how to walk, learn how to talk, learn how to carry yourself. That's how I learned it. And God brought godly men and women in my life so that I could, I, I, I would see the Jesus in them and learn how to be a man of God. Regardless of your background. Hallelujah. Every eye close, every head bow. Pastor Cortez. This part two message was to me. Could you pray for me right where I am? I'm not going to invite you to the front. I'm just going to pray right where you are. And if this message resonated to, with your spirit this morning, I'm going to pray for you. Right now, Pastor Cortez, would you pray for me? If that's you, would you lift up your hand right where you are? Yes, 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 yes. Look at this, yes. You can put your hands down. Thank you so much. Pastor Cortez. 
I'm in church, but you know what? I'm not sure. I know I've never given my life to Jesus, or I'm not sure where I stand. I want to make sure that I'm right with the Lord. I, I want to repent of my junk or my sin. I want everything heaven has for me through Christ Jesus. If that's you, if that's you, you want to give your heart to the Lord this morning, would you raise your hand? I want to know who you are. Is there anyone here? Amen. I see a young man who's rededicating his life. You can put your hand down. Hallelujah. It's a, listen, it's not Pastor Cortez trying to hook you up with the church or hook you up with a religion. I'm trying to hook you up with Jesus. With Jesus. Whether you come back to this church or not, if you hook up with Jesus, I've done my job. Father, we thank you this morning that you reminded us through your word that you are our light and our salvation. When we experience dark places, and we will if we have it, that is life on earth. We live in a broken world, and we live in a broken body, and we, we try to manage broken relationships. And there will be sporadic blackouts or long-term blackouts. But, Father, I pray that we may not abandon the light. The light is not an it. It is a person. That we may be determined, determined to live for the Lord. One thing I desire, David says, one thing. And when David was hiding, hiding in caves, one thing he was pursuing. When David was being chased and harassed by his father-in-law, King Saul, who was throwing spears at him, one thing. When David was betrayed by his own son, one thing. When David was uh, experienced one of the worst moments and his entire family was kidnapped and all his friends and his army were about to stone him and the Bible says he wept until he could weep no more, one thing. He was determined to keep serving the Lord even in the difficult times. And you came through each and every time. That's why he wrote some marvelous psalms. And Father, I pray that would be our determination. One thing. When we have priorities, then there's one top priority on earth. And that is not to retire well. Our top priority is to live for the Lord well while on earth, so that when we stand before him one day, he can tell us, well done, my good and faithful servant, enter into. Lord, the ultimate, the ultimate job uh, uh, review is when we stand before God. Father, I pray a blessing upon each person here today at Family Life Assembly of God. Pray a blessing upon the woman of God that came to be a blessing to us through song yesterday and today. I pray for our Spanish language church, Casa de Vida, that, that met here on campus in the chapel behind us. We pray for the children in children's church and for those watching online. We pray for your blessing and your favor as we serve you. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said, amen and amen. God bless you. Love one another. Go to the book table, uh, Vanessa's table, cookbook table, sign up, pre-order. God bless you.